Thank you very much. I really appreciate Gaydon's um, sponsoring this event. I think it it's very generous of you, very wise, because it's such a fabulous program. And my involvement started last year when I was asked by Sir Hanya to come to Brisbane to talk about this. And we met over a lunch, and it was literally a day here, a day back. And I was really galvanised by all the people in this gallery and the vision they had for the exhibition of Contemporary Australia Women. And it was very exciting for me to be involved in it. And then I realised how much work was involved. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, was, it was so thrilling for me to go back over the years, look at films with Rosie Hayes, we nutted out programs together, and, and to revisit so many of those films and to realise that there's most probably a whole generation of young Australians that have never seen Sweetie. I was at a screening the other day talking to a fellow critic who had never seen Sweetie. I think it's mandatory. You have to see Sweetie before you die. <laughs> uh, but so it's been a wonderful experience for me, uh, revisiting these films, thinking about them in terms of this exhibition, uh, being involved with this celebration of women's contribution to film in this country and women's representation in film in this country. And I just hope that you embrace this program with as much gusto as I was involved in preparing it. And now I want to enjoy, uh, invite these wonderful women, uh, Gillian Armstrong, Anna Kokinos and Louise Alston, to the stage to join me to talk about their work as women in this industry. I wanted to start by, I have this theory that the Australia is much better represented in terms of gender balance uh, as far as the film industry is concerned than just about any other country in the world. And it ha just happened that the resurgence of our film industry happened during the late 1960s, 70s, when feminism was really rolling along strong. And I think that the mentality of the community towards women, the fact that we were, it was a new industry, uh, was a combination of a, cu a couple of wonderful elements, opportunities for women and this new burgeoning film industry. And so I thought it would be interesting to get a take from each of uh, Jill and Anna and Lu Louise uh, about their entry into the film industry and whether it was made easy for them, whether they are encouraged because they're a woman. And I'd like to start with Jill because you Being came the into oldest, the industry. Yep. <laughs> no, you were... You were <laughs> we didn't want to mention that you were older. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no, no. I was Because uh, you'd mentioned this to me earlier and um, I was trying to spot... I'm, I'm a bit blinded, but I think there are some young people here and um, I love telling young people... Um, that when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, there were no Australian films. I mean, it, it's interesting, uh, over the years, international film critics would say to me, and so tell me about, you know, your childhood, I suppose, you went into the cinema like Marty Scorsese or young George Miller and you saw the images of the movie on the big screen and you thought, that's it, one day I will do this. And I said, sorry, well, first of all, I came from Australia. There were no Australian films in the cinema, so I had no thought that an Australian could do it, number one. Number two, there, were, there was no such thing as a woman director as far as I knew growing up, so why did I think that? So, no, um, Marty might have, and you know, but no, I thought somehow or other I wanted to do something in the arts, and you know, it was a much um, more circuitous route that I found through theatre and so on. But I was very lucky. I agree with you, Margaret. Two things happened in Australia. One, that we actually had an inc incredibly strong feminist movement, um, which I was very affected by. And two, the Australian government set up funding to say we should encourage filmmaking in this country. Um, but the third thing that happened was, you know, I had a fantastic <laughs> mother and father. I had parents who said, you can do whatever you want to do. 
And that was inc very unusual. I mean, all the people I was at Vermont High School with, the other girls were, you know, it was teaching or nursing or secretarial work, whereas I had, I mean, I have to admit, my father was a frustrated photographer, artist, and maybe that was part of his agenda that he wanted to encourage um, his daughter to go into the arts because he didn't have the chance. But I do feel that part of my grounding was the fact that I had very unusual parents that were willing to back me and encourage me in whatever I wanted to do. Um, but yes, when I finally got to Hollywood, um, to answer the other part of, um, of your statement, I real where I was considered a freak there that I'd made a feature film and there were v only maybe one or two women, this is in the um, 70s, who directed films and they were basically had got the break because they were famous actors. Um, and I realised the difference between the American film industry and the Australian film industry was it was in, in America, it was entrenched, it was conservative, it was big business and it was run by an older generation of men. Um, whereas in Australia, because it was government backed and it was considered an artistic cultural exercise, um, the younger, uh, more liberated men, because the feminist movement not only liberated women, it liberated men, they had no problem. So when I did come out of film school with you know, a little short that won awards, it was, you know, young men came to me as well as women producers and offered me um, my first feature. So that, that was a big difference. And then I would like to say that when I did my first feature in Australia, my brilliant career, there I did find out there was, I mean, there was incredible hoo-ha and flack. I mean, people said things to my editor like, you know, I wonder if she's going to faint and fall over in the, in the outback. Um, there was still a feeling that could a woman do this and I was very aware that when I went out to make that film that it wasn't just for my career that I was carrying all women with me. I mean, Philip Noyce and I were at film school together and I, he made Newsfront in the same year and I used to say, you know, it's all, all right for you. It's, no, you know, it's hard enough making your first feature and thinking you're going to fail. I've got... You know, I've got, like, if, if, I, if I fail, it won't be that Jill Armstrong couldn't make a film. It would be that women can't do it. And there was, there were comments, you know, now hopefully people would be amazed by, that they would, people would come by the editing room and say to the editors before I, you know, while I was on the set shooting, like, does it all cut together? It was sort of like, could a woman work out how to put the pieces together? Could a woman actually, you know, physically stand up outside for a number of weeks and direct? Um, so, you know, we have come a long way since then and thank heavens for the sake of all the other women in Australia who got to make films, thank heavens that film didn't fail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, you, your experience, because My you experience. changed career mid-course, didn't well, you? Well, I did. I, I actually, um, well, I became a lawyer before I became a filmmaker and I had to sort of do Why things. is it so many lawyers want to be filmmakers? Be uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, I actually did law because when I was a teenager, I had no idea that you could become a filmmaker, that it could even be a career, something that I could actually do. Um, and so when I thought about what I wanted to do, um, law seemed like a really good option. I was, you know, academically inclined. I uh, felt that, you know, that somehow law, social justice, those sorts of kind of questions for me seem to marry in that kind of idea. Um, and so I became a lawyer. But as a teenager as well, when I was about 14, 15, I started going to see films at um, Melbourne Uni Union Theatre, and I was very young. And in those days, before art house cinemas really kind of had taken off in this country, Melbourne, you know, like universities would have film clubs and those sorts of things. And so I started going to see European films, and in particular European art house films. And they were a complete revelation because what I discovered when I saw these films was that film wasn't, wasn't merely about entertainment, but it was also a way of... Um, expressing oneself 
I, I can remember seeing cries and whispers when I was 14, which of course as a 14 year old I just didn't understand. But here was film as art. Here was film as uh, a means of expression to in a way uh, talk and deal with things that were completely emotional about inner states, about inner secrets. And I remember being completely struck by the possibility of cinema as art. So I kind of carried that idea inside me for many years because I felt that I'd been exposed to it, I had fallen in love with it, and it was very deep inside me, but I didn't know how to become a filmmaker. So it kind of, I buried it for a long period of time until, um, you know, I'd gone to, I'd done law, I was practicing as a lawyer. Um, it was clear that at, at a certain point I was really going to have to commit to being a lawyer because the firm I was working for, um, you know, had offered me a partnership. And so there was a very classic fork in the road situation where I either fully committed to being a lawyer or I followed this other desire that I had in me, was, which was to become a filmmaker. And basically, I set about um, throwing my law career in and going, OK, for the next couple of years, I'm going to work out how I might be able to apply to film school and actually try this thing. Um, and I, ha and I, and my view was, well, I'm young enough to do it. I may be completely hopeless at it. I may have no talent in it, but at least I won't die wondering. And that's how I really started. But how did you start? What was the? Where did, where did you go? I mean, I literally just borrowed an eight, uh, a Super 8 camera, and I went out and I actually shot uh, a small, a short film, three-minute film, and I edited it in camera because I had no access to facilities at that point. And that was a really interesting exercise because it meant I actually had to create, literally create the, the film in camera. So I shot it in sequence, timed it and did all that. Then I discovered that, and then, and so what I thought about was, well, I, w I w really wanted to go to the Swinburne, Swinburne Film and TV School, which uh, was still in existence in those days in Melbourne. Um, and I think, Julie, you were even at the That's where I went, Swinburne. yeah. Yep. And, um, and I guess... I guess I um, just sort of spent two years thinking about it, about applying to film school. And then there was, in fact, a program called Women Applying to, F to Film and TV School because the statistics were that when women applied to film schools, whether it was the VCA, which is now what it's called, or the Australian Film and Television Radio School, um, what would happen is that lots of young men would apply and if they were rejected, they would apply reapply, reapply until they got in. But if women were rejected first up, often they would never re re reapply again because they just couldn't cope with the rejection. So this program had actually been created to actually support women in that application process. And it was largely, you could make a short film, but it was really kind of saying, look, we, we want you to, we're going to help you kind of morally and kind of on all sorts of other levels to actually make an application and actually, you know, get in. So I, I did that that particular program that was that was running at the time, and then I was lucky, you know, I was successful in my first attempt. Um, so so there were programs, but and just going back to, I mean, the second wave of feminism here was just so crucial because the government funding bodies had had active policies about actually supporting the female voice, supporting female filmmakers and I and I would argue that we've probably got the most one of the most prog we had in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s one of the most socially progressive kind of funding arrangements I would argue um, uh, you know I guess the French do pretty well but sort of um, but you know I think that we've had an incredibly prog and that has actually created you know, when you look at the program that Margaret's put together, um, it is a wealth of talent um, that has been sort of um, really come through uh, in these last decades that, that uh, have actually kind of really made significant contributions to this, the, the Australian, not only the Australian film landscape, but the global cinema landscape as well, I think. And just very quickly, mentors, well, Role models like Gillian Armstrong and Jane Campion were also powerfully significant for me. Um, 
as in I can remember going along to see their films when I was not a filmmaker and thinking, you know, well, if they can do it, so can I. And so there is this whole question of, of a lineage and a kind of an acknowledgement that the women who kind of broke that new ground for us actually also, I think, on all sorts of levels, gave us the capacity to also believe that we could do it too. Mm. Louise, follow yes. on. Um, <laughs> in so many ways. Um, <laughs> but um, as, as a third waiver, you'd say, um, I, um, I grew up in a world where there were, um, there was Jane Campion, there was Julian Armstrong, and, um, and I watched VHSs, I watched videos and I watched their films, and, um, and I was in high school in the 90s when there was a lot of, um, when Jane, when the piano was on in, um, in okay. cinema, and um, also at that time uh, a film called Love and Other Catastrophes, Emma Kate Krogan directed. Um, so, and Emma Kate Krogan's film had been self-funded. Uh, she and her friends had got together and um, and made it um, with what they had, and that was um, the that was a very influential, um, very influential on me. Now I did you just wait? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you have this concept of yourself at that time of being able to be a, a director, a filmmaker? Um, well, I. I'd always loved films. I'd always wanted to make films and work in films. I'd never, I never really came to a point of saying, I am going to be a director now. Um, when I did, I was working, I went to TV. Um, I was from Wagga Wagga. And um, my first job was at Win News in Wagga, cutting the nightly news. Um, and that was very good training ground for making pictures tell stories and um, and just producing. You have to have the half-hour show on every night. And so um, uh, from that I got into film school, into the TV um, department um, and because of women who'd come before, uh, it was for men, for women. And um, while I was there, I met a very uh, cute young, run, young writer boy um, and who I started um, working with and dating. And um, uh, fast forward uh, a while and um, I <laughs> was producing a script that Stephen was writing. Um, and I knew that I wasn't really in a position to direct this film. Um, I, well, I didn't even consider myself being considered to be director for this film. I knew that um, if I went into any of the, the funding bodies, I didn't have anything to stand on. Um, and uh, so when I, um, so, we, so we went with uh, a male director, a Brisbane guy, and, um, and but then um, that didn't work out. So I sort of said, well, and all this time, I was kind of secretly thinking, I wonder if I can make him write the same sort of film for me to direct sometime in the future. <laughs> but um, then when um, uh, we were sitting there when everything had fallen apart and we, th we said, well, maybe I could direct it. Maybe we could do it with our own money. And um, so we did. And so we moved back to Brisbane and that's where Stephen was born and grew up and so we um we made all my friends live in brisbane with our own money and then we got help from the government at the at the end of it so um yes and then we made juicy in much the same way so do you bring a sense of being a woman to your work in the sense of uh projects that you choose genres that you go for uh people that you want to work with? Should we go the same order? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, a, a, as you know, Margaret, I've hated that I've, that it always says um, woman filmmaker Gillian Armstrong and it doesn't say male filmmaker Philip Noyce or male filmmaker Peter Weir. I felt that that was 
actually quite yes, you've always reacted against yes, that. sexist <laughs> that, that I was in that box a and would be very upset when my films were put into a woman's program early on you know the Australian films and then mine was in so I was like excuse me I'm my own person and I doesn't matter if I'm a man or a woman but I'm my own person and I happen to be a woman so therefore um, I'm not I'm, as a director there are things that are about my taste and how I see the world um, I my taste could be completely different to Anna's, but at the same time, there are other things, I suppose, that are the same. Um, but so, yeah, I, I would never, I mean, I have never, all the scripts that I've made in my life, I've been very fortunate, there have been films that I've had a really personal response to. There have been stories that I've loved, I was passionate about, I believed in, because they touched something in me. Um, so, yeah, even right in the beginning with Brilliant Career, which I had to say I was secretly hoping I could do a smaller film before I did it because it was such a big, um, at that time, a huge film. And, um, and someone made a comment to me about the book and said, well, I suppose you've got to cast a really plain actress because she keeps going on about how ugly she is. And, like, the bells went off in my head. And I thought that was one of the reasons why I went, OK, I'm going to do this film because... There's no other woman at the moment who's um, <laughs> ready to do direct, and it would be terrible if a man did that film because that is a male view of a young woman. I know, and every woman knows, that every single adolescent girl says to herself, looks in the mirror and says, you know, I'm ugly and this is wrong and that's wrong, and, you know, most of us do it for, for, for the rest of our life, <laughs> women. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that, I mean, I really took that film on because I thought a woman has to make this. Um, and in the end, years later, I took on Little Women for the same reason, even though I felt I've, you know, in some ways it was too similar, brilliant career, but I th then I thought, you know what? Louise's work, she was such... Um, a so ahead of her time and such a, a breakthrough as a woman writer and yet there's things in that story as wonderful a director as George Cukor is but he felt that Joe had to be a tomboy and I thought there's pr it, it's not that's a very simplistic way to judge a woman who's got an independent spirit and who's got a talent and wants something in life so yes no I absolutely um, believe that um, that women do see women and know women better than men do. And we, you know, we're going to obviously tell their stories in a different way to how a man would. And, you know, I'm very proud of that. And I've turned down a lot of scripts where I've thought women have been treated in a really sexist way. And, and certainly my own taste, but, you know, there's many, many types of women directors out there. And Catherine Bigelow, for instance, is a wonderful action director. Hurt Locker, she first Academy Award for a woman. Um, but I don't want to make the same sort of films. She obviously is really interested in, in action and violence and it's actually not something that I've ever been interested in unless it really comes out of character. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I th it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a vexed question, you know. Um, I mean, I, I not only wear the, um, the female tag, but I also wear an ethnic tag. I wear a, uh, a queer tag. I mean, there are a number of kind of tags that I can remember when Head On came out, I was kind of referred to as a Greek-Australian filmmaker. <laughs> um, you know, and then when I made uh, the Book of Revelation, the Greek bit got dropped. So it's, it, it's, it's a complicated question because on the one hand, we, we, I mean, I agree with Gillian that, that, that you don't want to be kind of pigeonholed. Um, and yet at the same time, I think, in fact, if anything, in certainly the last few years, I, I, I've begun to feel very acutely that, in fact, being a woman, being uh, that Greek cultural background, uh, you know, my sexuality, all of those things are deeply informing every, absolutely everything I do, you know. And in fact, um, I think I went through a phase where I, I got really angry when people would call me ex kind of filmmaker. But actually... I don't really worry about those labels anymore because in a funny sort of way, they kind of fit, you know, they do it, they are there. And so if, you know, if I was called a really, really good filmmaker who happened, for example, to have a, a feminist wog, uh, uh, you know, queer bent, I, c I sort of feel quite comfortable with that. <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> Let
Louise. Well, I just get really excited when anyone calls me a filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I, I must say that um, um, when I was watching Hurt Locker, I thought that um, that, that film was a war film made by a woman. And there was the reason why I thought that was there was times like when he goes home and he's in a supermarket, like what other war film does a man go home and he's in a supermarket and 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 he's and you can and you feel that the the, the home and the war and that and that, that distance between and that communication between those two things. And you can see also they talk about being fathers. And there's a moment where he walks in um, very aggressively with machine guns into a woman's kitchen and she's going, get out of my kitchen! And she's screaming at him in Arabic. And, um, and that's actually a man, an American soldier walking into a woman's kitchen. And I thought, this is a war film that a woman made. Like, and there was a lot of those little moments where I thought mm. there was... That could be seen. It's like there's a text uh, in, th that sits under the text. I mean, I tend to generate a lot of my projects, and so the, what I pick is very much something that I know I'm going to nurture for a long period of time, and therefore I have to feel very pa passionate about it. But even if you're actually, you know, taking on a, f a project that's been that's come to you, you know, there is a level on which even as a director, you ca you know, as a director, on, in, in all kinds of ways, you're constantly putting in another text beneath the work itself, you know, uh, and it's coming from a particular sensibility, it's coming from an aesthetic, and it's coming from a kind of a set of concerns that only that particular filmmaker can really express. And, and I do think that, you know, you're right, there is a kind of a whole other text that women put into their work that is very much um, about all kinds of really interesting choices where, where you know, um, a war film will have a, a, man, a man going into a supermarket or whatever. But it's, it's deeper than that. It's to do with the emotional terrain, the way we express ourselves, the way we perceive the world. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think there are very few male film, filmmakers, and there are some in my view, who absolutely are superb with the representation of women, but I think it's pretty rare. Louise, you work with your partner Stephen yep. on films. Now, how how does that work? I mean, how does he get your women so well? Um, well, Stephen's always written women really well, and um, and I think that's part of why you know the man, part of the man, and why I I love him so much. Um, and he, so he's always, and he's, I think he grew up in a family with two brothers, and he's always wanted a sister, and so. I think he writes sisters that he would want to <laughs> would want to <laughs> have around him, and he and he's always had female friends as well. So um, so that conversation um, is always there. Interestingly, all my friends leaving Brisbane was written as a play and directed by um, a man, and um, and that in that play it was it was it had more of a a. a, a a tone kind of like um, about a boy. It was a. It was more about the male character as protagonist, and it was about. Um, and it kind of didn't end well. And um, and so when we translated it into um, into a film, um, well, I, well, I decided to make it about make the protagonist the woman, um, and that was really a kind of a. a business decision because I, I knew that um, romantic comedies with male leads weren't as successful as romantic comedies with female leads. But, um, <laughs> but then I was going into um, what she thought about the relationship and what she wanted and how this girl was kind of creating the things that she wanted in her life that she thought she was supposed to do and, and, and she wanted to create these relationships that didn't really exist. and. Um, and so I kind of really inhabited her. And, um, and in the end, we came back to reshoot the ending because um, having it end badly um, was really mean. It didn't make sense anymore. Um, and these choices that I'd made all the way along, it, and really I can say that the characters decided to get together and I couldn't keep them apart. <laughs> 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 they really did fall in love. So. That's well, I, I'm sort of interested in 
the body of work here that, and, and I've got another theory which I'll throw at you, which is that the beginning of the 70s, the beginning of the, the revival of the film industry, coincided with really the, the, the death of the, of, of the traditional family, that it was women were given a chance for an education in a way they had never been before. Uh, they were uh, given the opportunities of employment. Uh, they were had the ability to get rid of their husbands or they had the ability to survive their husbands getting rid of them. Um, so you had this breakdown of, uh, of a... Of of a mould, really. And I, looking at these films, I felt so many of them were in some ways uh, searches for contemporary women finding their way I in Australian society. I mean, do you... Uh, Can I jump in? Yes. Um, just, the, just while I remember, um, it was interesting, the thing with my brilliant career, which had been written... Um, my Miles Franklin in the 1890s, that um, at the end, the thing that was revolutionary about that book, and and it became revolutionary in the film which we made in 1978, was that at the end of it she said no to Harry, um, and we actually had a little bit of trouble at the last minute with the distributor, um, who felt that women wouldn't go and see a film. Um, because they expect at the end that the, a romance that the couple will come together. Mm. And it's, it also seems incredibly quaint to think that was like quite revolutionary at the time and the producer, Margaret Fink, and I had to really fight for it. And I said, you know, in some ways for the people in the audience who are real romantics, she sort of says just, you know, maybe, but not now, maybe there is some time, some time later. And that was the thing that resonated and was considered revolutionary with that film all around the world, even though our New York Times critic, Janet Maslin, said, if only she could have still had Harry and written the book. Um, <laughs> as I said, you know, I felt, well, she could meet him in Paris in 10 years' time when she's written the book. But, you know, it's, it's strange to yeah. think that that was... That's not long ago that that was considered and we nearly had to have a fight. I have to say, David Williams from Grand Union, when he saw the film, said, no... Um, it's fine, we'll leave it. But we nearly had a fight on our hands, mm. so that was considered so tough and brave. And then, years later, when I was doing High Tide, because of my reaction, I was so upset about being pushed into this woman um, filmmaker, therefore she only does films about women, because, you know, she's a woman, so she cares about women. And it was like, can I make a story about a man or a boy, please? Like, men make them about girls. So we wrote, Laura Jones and I wrote High Tide about this surfer who comes across um, this girl at a beach who's surfing as well. It turns out he's, it's his long lost daughter that he's run out on. And it was really interesting. We were just, we just started casting. We had the first meeting with the casting director who'd given us a list of names. I think we're probably going through going, oh, well, yeah, there's Brian Brown, you know, this 30 year old um, lead. And I, that night I went out to see an Australian film that Joe Kennedy, who's in Starstruck, was in called Wrong World with Richard Moyer, and on the way home in the car, I said to my darling, um, it's the same story. This, you know, drifting guy is affected by the relationship with, you know, a young, innocent but bright young woman, and that makes him reconsider his life. And then I started thinking, and it's, it's Paper Moon. I was thinking of all the films I thought, and John said to me, why don't you just change it to a woman? I said, no, everyone expect that because it's Laura Jones and it's me and it's Sandra <laughs> Levy that women will do, make a film about a woman. And he said, who cares? And I went, mm, yeah, no, maybe you're right. <laughs> so I got home, I rang my producer, I said, and by the way, we'd raised the money for this film. I said, so we started ca casting. What if we changed the main character, the surfer, to a woman who's run out on her daughter? And Sandra went, well, I'd go with that, talk to the writer. So I ring Laura, I might have left it till the morning, <laughs> and said, what do you think? And she went, yeah, no, I'll do it. And in the end, it was so much braver, so much more yeah. original. Um, it was that thing that was niggling in my, I thought something about this story, I felt like we've seen the story. So, and then changing it to a woman who had run out and was going to keep running on that kid 
in the end made it um, so so much stronger. And of course, in the end, we cast you know wonderful Judy Davis in the part. But so so yeah, I. I but I have done films with male leads, I promise. <laughs> Mel Gibson, <laughs> Ray <Rachel> Fiennes. <laughs> <laughs> I like men. <laughs> um, look, I agree. I agree with your theory, Margaret. And uh, if anything, um, I guess artists, um, I, th I guess that is the role of the artists in society, in a way, to actually reflect um, and to pick up on and to kind of see the shifts that are happening, you know. And so, yes, there were... Um, certainly when we think about the 70s uh, and the huge shifts that happen in this country with, you know, many, many years of a conservative government, a Labor government coming in, radical reforms, uh, the sort of sexual revolution, the feminist revolution, you know, there was an enormous amount that was shifting in this country as those shifts were also happening globally but they're also happening here in very particular ways and I guess the role of the artist is really to kind of reflect that to actually be speaking sometimes a little bit ahead of um, what's happening and actually being the ones who come out and actually you know like articulate it in some way for people to kind of think about or respond to or to kind of have a sense that you know all of a sudden stories, uh, we're, we're seeing stories on the screen that are reflecting something also about our own lives um, in a very kind of powerful and potent way. I mean, my particular experience with Only the Brave, which was the first film that I made, was also, I guess, a film that came out of my particular set of experiences, which is also the migrant experience. So it's female, it's migrant, and also my particular class experience as well. And so, you know, you know, I noticed that it's in the program and I think one of the things that, that was very important for me when I was actually writing the story with uh, my co-writer, Mira Robertson, it was very much um, a set of experiences that I knew something about because that's where I came from. I grew, grew up in the outer western suburbs of Melbourne. I came from a migrant family and they were working class. And so all of those kind of social factors completely and utterly influence the making, the storytelling and the making of that film. And I think one of the really big issues is, you know, something I go on about is constantly the capacity for those different voices to have access to filmmaking, access to the arts in a way which means that we ended up getting what I call a pluralistic set of voices in the arts, not just one mainstream set of voices in the arts, uh, mainstream voices in the arts. And so, you know, we are always constantly in danger, I think, of having the sort of the, the mainstream white male voice that is the default position constantly. And the trouble we have and the difficulty we have is how do we generate, uh, a, you know, how do, we, how do we see, you know, the young Turkish Australian filmmaker or young Muslim filmmaker at the moment that, that, that potentially could tell us something about that world within this world that's going to be kind of really illuminating for us and really important. So it's, I think it's an ongoing kind yeah. of question and yeah. it's a really big question. Okay. Louise, I'm interested in your response to this because a lot of the films in uh, are quite serious explorations of women finding their place, but in Juicy, it's rather the same problems, really. They're searching for a, some safe place for themselves. Yeah. Uh, but it's done in a, an exuberant and very idiosyncratic way. I guess so, and I, I get we, we set out to make a film that was, that had a tone of, of lightness and happiness and, and cuteness, and that came from the um, the two leads um, who are with us today, with us today Cindy Nelson, Francesca Gastine, um, who, if you guys don't know, um, were very key in developing the characters with me and um, and the elements for the story, and so which Stephen then went on and made better than my first draft that wasn't very good, and so um, and so um, that. We wanted that was the thing that we wanted to make, um, and within that, so we're able to tell. We always want to tell truth, like we always wanted to go to what was real and what was, and and we could do that because a lot of it was being created by 
these two actors who were who it was really almost based on and um, or, or developed from. So a lot of the issues in it, whilst being light and sweet and um, colourful, um, are quite heavy when you really look at it. Um, and even even with the with the references to Jane Eyre, um, you know. Um, and there's a little bit there about Jane Eyre being the costume drama and, and all the costume dramas that have that have come before and um, and and looking at how Jane um, Jane Eyre is a conversation between or can be read as a conversation between a mad woman and a and a woman who's not considered mad and um, and who and they're trying to create. And this woman, Jane Eyre, is trying to create her life. And I guess that is what um, Jackie and Lucy are doing in this film. So... Um, in a very delightful way, I must well, say. thank you. Yeah. I don't know if I answered that properly. Yes, I, and I, I must say that I, uh, it has also been a factor in, in choosing films for this, uh, uh, films like Juicy that I think are absolutely delightful and have been majorly underseen. And there are a number of, uh, of films in the, in the program that, you know, my heart bleeds for. I, I want, I love them, and I want other people to love them. They just haven't had a chance to do it, so I hope you'll grasp the opportunity. And I just want to ask, finally, because I can't believe that we're getting towards the end, um, defining moments of women, women's representation in cinema, now, either from Australian films or internationally. God, so many. Um, but can I uh, look? Because we, we're running out of time, let's just. I'm going to stick to two Australian films. High Tide, which I think yeah. is a magnificent film, and the the scene between Judy Davis and uh, young Cordy Cavan. I think it's the. It's, I think it's the scene when she goes into the bathroom or the toilets, oh, and there's yeah. that yes. extraordinary moment of realization that that is her daughter. Uh, wonderful, incredible moment. The other film that I think is remarkable is Fran. Um, I had a really great opportunity to see Fran recently, the Glenda Hambly film, and I just noticed that it's actually on the program. If you get an opportunity to see that film, I'd love to see it projected because yes. I think it's quite a remarkable film. And also, um, Jan Kenny, who shot the film, the director of photography, I believe was the first female cinematographer in this country as well, and it's superbly shot. And there's an extraordinary central performance um, by... Noni Hazelhurst. Noni. Who one best Noni actress Hazelhurst for it, is, 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 is excellent. Oh, so, you wonderful. know, they're two fabulous films that I think um, deeply affected me, you know. So Jill, have you had a chance to... Well, uh, in the past, uh, uh, Jean Moreau in Jules and Jim, um, you know, I always remember her. I may yes. remember them jumping off the bridge. Yeah. Um, I would say that... I mean, I, I was saying I really want to see Sweetie again. I, I was, um, I, I mean, it certainly, it, you know, was compl I mean, I also had seen, I'd seen Jane's short, Peel, which were already went, my God, there's a talent there. But um, I was really knocked out by Sweetie and went, wow, you know, what's going on here? And, and probably Old Holly in Piano, a film which I'm constantly congratulated on and I take... <laughs> I, I, I take the congratulations. Uh, you know, I, I'm as proud as Jane is. Um, <laughs> no, because I, I uh, was talking about Sweetie the other day, and she actually had the piano prepared before she made Sweetie. But she knew that Sweetie was so idiosyncratic, she most probably would not get the chance to make that film after she'd made the piano. So we were really lucky that she got it in mm. first, and I think that was a very low budget effort too. Mm. And me. Um, uh, growing up watching stories on screen, um, young women often s have only the girl to identify with, and that's known as the Smurfette syndrome, mm. um, <laughs> where there is just the one girl usually wearing a leotard um, and she doesn't have a really exciting role. 
Now, um, when I watched Star Wars, there was the girl. Um, but towards the end of the film, when things started getting really exciting, they came on when they were, dis they, when they were going to um, go in. Again, they've got the plans. Um, many people have suffered to get these plans to, you know, for the, for the Death Star. And it's a female general. And she's going, righto, guys, everyone listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'm just in there so proud, so excited. She's, she's in charge and she's going to, she's, you know, and everyone's listening to her. She's not like <laughs> on the side. She's not wearing a leotard. She looks really serious. <laughs> And it's not just one girl in this film. There's like, and if there's like two, there must be others. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so, and then in the very end, when they're all going up to, you know, um, when everyone's cheering and the winners been happening, and everyone's, and the boys are at the front, and they get medals from the princess because she's in charge. <laughs> 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 She's the most important person in the film. And, you should <laughs> and so I went home knowing that. <laughs> A feminist interpretation of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> 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 this time has just gone whoosh. Uh, yeah. You're so great, all of you. And uh, they're all wonderful filmmakers. Thank you for sharing what you have today. Are well, the people allowed to ask any questions? No, I, no, I'm afraid not. not. I, oh, I, sorry. I, I would <laughs> love that. But uh, the next session's going to start in a very short oh, space a film, of time. Oh, a film, a wonderful film. This yeah. is one of my favorite films. And we have to, I've been given a time limit and we've reached it. So thank you all so very much for coming today. Thank you guys. Thank you. you are wonderful. <laughs> Lovely.